All right, so it's exactly 2 p.m. here on the East Coast. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, depending on where you are. Thanks for joining our event to discuss the creation of a National Patient Safety Authority called Brainstorming Solutions to Medical Harm, Creating a National Patient Safety Authority. So that's me. <laughs> My name is Sabah Bhatnagar. I'm the co-deputy director of the Healthcare Value Hub at Altarum. And I'm going to be kicking things off today. If you've joined us for past webinars, you'll be used to hearing Lynn Quincy's voice on the line. But as of June, Lynn has been enjoying semi-retired life. And although she's still with us at the Hub serving as our senior advisor, Amanda and I, co-deputy directors of the Healthcare Value Hub, now lead the day-to-day -day work of the Hub. And we are thrilled to be here with all of you. Before we kick off our event, I wanted to cover a few housekeeping items. Boring, I know. All lines will be muted till Q&A. And I'm sure by this point, many of you are used to platforms like Zoom, but this one's a little bit different. You'll have the option to unmute yourself during the Q&A segment, and we'll have instructions for that later on. We're eager to hear your thoughts, so we hope that you do participate in Q&A. And we'll only be able to hear you if you're dialing in using your phone. Computer audio is listen in only, but you'll still be able to type into chat. Feel free to use chat to ask whatever questions you want. This webinar is also being recorded for people who are unable to join and will be posted on our website. So if you make any remarks, please keep that in mind. And if you experience any technical problems, please feel free to reach out to Elise Lowry at elise.lowry at altarum.org. We also have a hashtag for this event if you want to follow along on Twitter. That's hashtag MedicalHarmNPSA. Um, we have a great lineup of speakers here with us today to discuss this very important topic of establishing a national patient safety authority in order to address medical harm. Although it's somewhat difficult to measure, medical harm is believed to be the third leading cause of death in the United States, and it must be addressed in order to make the healthcare system work better for the people it serves. More than 20 years ago, the Institute of Medicine documented a staggering number of patient safety deaths, patient deaths related to preventable, preventable medical errors, and later advocated for a fundamental sweeping redesign of the health system. But sadly, we haven't made a lot of progress since. A recent study found that one in 20 patients are exposed to preventable harm events through their interactions with the medical system. One strategy that's Gaining traction is the idea of a national patient safety authority, similar to those established in the transportation and aviation space. And we're going to take a deeper dive into that topic today. So first, we'll hear from Karen Wolk Feinstein, the president and CEO of the Jewish Healthcare Foundation and the Pittsburgh Regional Health Initiative. Under her leadership, JHF and PRHI have become a leading voice in patient safety, healthcare quality, and related workforce issues. They have taken a lead on the SWERVE initiative, which intends to galvanize our healthcare leaders to create a regulatory authority that will guarantee safe patient care in the future. And she'll be talking to us about what a national patient safety authority could look like. Next, we'll hear from John T. James, founder of Patient Safety America and former chief toxicologist at NASA Johnson Space Center. He's been a patient safety activist for over 14 years, and he'll be talking about the prevalence of medical harm and the impact on patients as fam and families, as well as the importance of establishing an NPSA and how to make that NPSA responsive to people. Our third speaker is Regina Hoffman, Executive Director of Pennsylvania's Patient Safety Authority and Editor-in-Chief of Patient Safety. She administers the Pennsylvania Patient Safety Authority, charged with taking steps to reduce and eliminate medical errors by identifying problems and recommending solutions to promote patient safety. She'll be talking about what states can do provide some background on Pennsylvania safety authority and how state entities and a national authority could potentially work together. 
and after that we'll have plenty of time for Q&A. So with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Feinstein. Thank you. Um, I'm going to give everyone a quick taste of what we mean by a National Patient Safety Authority, and then I'm anxious to hear from all of you. So um, let's think about my life with a, a split personality. Uh, the Jewish Healthcare Foundation has three operating arms. And I'm going to mostly be speaking with my personality as the Pittsburgh Regional Health Initiative, which is um, one of our supporting organizations committed to quality, safety, and containing costs. So we've had a number of areas of focus for quite a few years, but we're going to fo focus in today on patient safety, health innovation and technology, and infectious disease. We've had a long-standing um, fight with infectious disease everywhere from HIV and measles and HPV, now COVID, and through the Regional Health Initiative, we've tried to eliminate and greatly reduce all the initials from CLABC and UTI to C. diff, MRSA, and ventriculostomy infection. So we've been focused, as I said, so many years on working on patient safety, 20 plus years, and uh, we've actually had very little success. We've tried it all, a dose of quality engineering, but not enough to make a difference. Changing the culture at the front line, yeah, getting busy nurses and nurses' aides, uh, to immediately report every near miss and trace it to root cause. Public reporting, learning collaboratives, checklists and longer checklists, activating governing boards, that hasn't worked, penalties and rewards that are limp, cloning Gary Kaplan and uh, others. So the question is, are we going to try for more of the same in a bigger package or take a swerve? And as it's already been pointed out, uh, Medical error is the third leading cause of death. So swerve is what we decided on. Let's look for a new solution. Let's look for something powerful in an election year. It's not only an election year where maybe a new administration comes in looking for new opportunities, but you also have COVID, which has laid bare all the flaws we already have in worker and patient safety. So our idea was, how about one singular agency, a national patient and provider safety authority that is totally focused on safety, um, data-driven, non-punitive, collaborative. And those words are all really important because we're not um, indifferent to the political aspects of trying to get anything new created, particularly something that regulates or imposes sanctions. However, we know there's a powerful model we can build on, the National Transportation Safety Board. Um, it, it seems to be a very popular, very effective agency, independent. It investigates accidents. It proposes recommendations and solutions and conducts research and education. Um, it's also a, a central database, database of accidents and um, can enlist experts from all over the country, but also sometimes around the world, to do a deep dive, deep investigations into a particular problem. So I mentioned that the NTSB is about solutions. So one of the things we love is how many of the solutions are autonomous. And why do we love those? Because we don't rely on humans, um, whether it's airbags or autonomous black adjusters. Um, their um, automatic shutoff valves, even the pipeline has autonomous inter in internal inspection capability. So why do we like it so much that so many of these autonomous solutions do not have any um, requirement for human intervention? Because that would allow doctors and other clinicians to do what they do best, which is practice the best possible medicine. So I also have, we love the NTSB, but I have these uh, dreams of NASA. So these are central command centers that now exist at a very few, but at some health centers and uh, within some health systems. And mostly a lot of their work is to make sure that the beds are filled um, and that a lot of the sort of 
things that can be adjusted from a central control uh, center, that those things can be managed with people constantly at the alert, constantly looking for snafus and blockages. So we think this has enormous potential for healthcare because you could also take these central command centers, they look like NASA, right? but also use them in the interest of safety. So the other possibility that we think is so important, if we could have one singular agency with one focus, you can see here that we have um, about 15 different federal agencies and many independent agencies that have some piece of patient and worker safety whether it's collecting data, it could be research, um, data collection, accreditation, payment and reimbursement regulation, but we have a, a plethora of groups, sometimes with redundant responsibilities, but as we've all seen um, during COVID, we have not been able to manage the infection with any of the um, strength and capability that some other countries have because of their strong central authority. So we looked at the many things. Um, I particularly like what's happened in Japan and Singapore and China, but other countries, um, they got their act together. They not only commissioned many of their manufacturing plants to produce adequate uh, PPEs and testing, they sent staff to where staff were needed, when they were needed, they provided resources, um, at just in time when they were needed. And they were able to disseminate best practices rapidly. They were, they were, let's be honest, they were not only prepared for a pandemic, but they knew what, what to do once it hit. So other industries, by the way, use what's available. They have a communications infrastructure, they're data driven, they use machine-based intelligence. All the things you see listed here whether it's nuclear power, um, cyber security, just basic manufacturing, um, aviation, of course NASA, they land people on the moon. They put all of our current capabilities to work to anticipate harm and intervene before it happens, but also to be on alert immediately for any glitch and to fix as many of those glitches autonomously and automatically as possible. So technology is also a key in many other ways. Um, right now, much of our review of incidents is very time intensive unnecessarily, but also we miss, we know how many adverse events we miss. The estimates could go as high as <laughs> almost uh, 80%. But the one thing we do know is that we're missing a lot of these events. And, and why does that matter? Because if we're not aware of what's happening in the environment, we're probably not in the best position to fix it, particularly as you drill down and drill down, uh, down to the local level, the unit level. We also know we have all the ingredients. Um, and this is something that, that has to be painful to me. As you can imagine, I'm sitting here in the shadow of Carnegie Mellon University. Um, we have all the ingredients. Data, we're, we're an international center for AI, for autonomous um, vehicles. We are um, able at CMU now and with some of the spinoffs. We can have an 18-wheeler semi barreling down the turnpike at 75 miles an hour totally safe, safely because we have a platform. We have autonomous vehicles driving all over our region. We're a center for that. Um, machine learning gurus are right here at CMU. Tom Mitchell is my neighbor. We have robotics that we put to work in all kinds of hazardous situations and rescues, not to mention exploring Mars. We have applied predictive analytics and AI as a center, and we even have the block center here, which tries to harness these for public good. It works on fire risk, child welfare protection, breast cancer detection, community services. Why not patient and worker safety? The whole industry as I think of it. 
So you may be asking yourselves, can medical error data be automated? We believe that 77% of quality and safety information can be automated right now using today's technology. We looked at the top 10 ECRI um, causes of harm in medicine and healthcare. And you can see here, I certainly can't read them all, but so many of these are amenable to autonomous solutions. And we find that also eye-opening, but encouraging. We also have looked at the work of Pascal Metrics, their patient real-time interoperable metrics engine, Prime, and their risk trigger software to know that we have the technology capability now to do many of the things that are already active in other industries. And some of you might have listened to the NPR program two days ago about the companies that are now using all of these tools to monitor their work environments to detect anything that might lead to an outbreak of COVID. So this is one of my favorites. This comes from the Applied Physics Lab at Johns Hopkins and their Institute for Assured Autonomy. Um, I call her or him, the pod, Madeira, the Medical Interoperability Reference Architecture Research Collaboration. What it really is, is a pod that can go onto a battlefield or a mass casualty event. It can do immediate diagnostics for the wounded, and it can keep the wounded alive for up to three days until they can be evacuated for medical care. So of course, I like to, in my imagination, imagine having a Madeira pod here available um, in our hospital. So instead of call over the loudspeaker for a rapid response team or a condition C, as we call it, team, people who are randomly selected each night and may have never worked together and may not be what the patient needs, we would send a Madeira pod in to stabilize them and also call for exactly the right clinical specialties that are needed. So the bottom line is, as far as we're thinking, now is the time for a national patient and provider safety authority. One singular agency with one singular focus who can come up with powerful solutions. They may be policy, they may be behavior change, they may be autonomous technologies, um, that can centralize and align all the data we collect in all of these different portals and give us the protections that I think the most powerful and uh, wealthiest nation in the world deserves. I am turning this over now to you, John. Okay, uh, thank you, Dr. Feinstein. So I'm gonna take a little different tack um, than Dr. Feinstein did. I'm gonna speak from a patient perspective about what I see as important through my novel as a patient for the National Patient Safety Authority to do. This is a summary of what I'm going to talk about, and please note that there are references at the bottom of my slides for the most part, and if you want to um, get on that reference and your copy doesn't have an electronic link, uh, send me an email or something and we can figure out how to get you that information. So I'm going to talk about what really worries patients, risks while hospitalized, uh, and how different entities have estimated the lethal preventable adverse events. And of course, it depends on how carefully you look for them. Um, secondly, I'm going to talk about worries of patients about not getting the care they need that they should. And I'm going to talk there about lethal preventable adverse events due to omission of needed care during hospitalization. Now, this is an important issue to me because I lost my son uh, to cardiologist who failed to provide potassium replacement for him when he had uh, life-threatening cardiac arrhythmias. So I have a passion for errors of omission, and you'll see those are not easy to find and, and figure out what to do about, but they're very common. Uh, I'm gonna talk about a critical interface, I think, 
Aside from any technology, I think informed consent must be done properly. It must be done through a shared decision-making platform, which is kind of the coming thing within medicine now. But to get this right is going to really make a lot of difference in healthcare. And then I'm going to talk a little about uh, things that have to do with the uh, authority. So now let's talk about the estimates of lethal preventable adverse events. I think many of you uh, listening to this are aware of the old IOM estimate from 2000. Uh, in fact, it used data from 1984. And as you're all aware, things have changed dramatically since 1984. We now have guidelines uh, for how to do the proper medical thing, not that they're you know, locked in, but they're guidelines for doctors to use. And uh, they explicitly uh, said in a later uh, book that they did not look at errors of omission which I think is, is important and hard to do, actually. Um, next uh, bullet shows uh, the next real advance, in my opinion, in terms of how to find uh, medical errors uh, was the Global Trigger Tool developed by the Institute of Healthcare Improvement. This tool uses uh, a platform of screening outcomes in medical records that suggest an adverse event, and then when physicians or experts look at that event, they decide it was preventable or not. It is capable typically of finding at least 10 times more adverse events than normal screening through medical records without any kind of tool. About 2010, I started noticing several studies using this tool that estimated, among other things, the number of lethal deaths in hospitals. Uh, nobody was doing anything with that, so I combined four studies and published a study in the Journal of Patient Safety in which I estimated between 200 and 400,000 people uh, had their lives seriously shortened because of errors that occurred during their hospital stay. doesn't mean that their life was shortened during the hospital and they died there. That's a key misunderstanding, and I'll show you how that flows out in a minute with some uh, focused input. I actually had a young doctor write me and say, how good do you expect us to be? My estimate says that a little over 1% of the people have something happen to them during hospitalization that shortens their life, either during hospitalization or later. I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention some much lower contemporary estimates. This is one from uh, a group of physicians uh, led by uh, Dr. Rodwin. Uh, they use what I would say the tip of the iceberg approach, and they estimate only 22,000 people die each year because of mistakes during hospitalization. Um, they didn't look at errors of omission, and they did not look at uh, deaths after hospitalization. So the next worry a patient has is, do I get all the care I need? Is something being omitted from my care that really would make a difference? Uh, they are not often measured, and they are hard to figure out and sort out. But I think there needs to be a growing focus on this. Often the deaths from an error of omission occur early, but outside the walls of the hospital. Now let me give you an example. The third bullet here, um, it was estimated by a physician in 2000 that of the 300,000 Americans that were dying each year of heart failure, about 100,000 of them were dying early because they were not getting beta blockers. Now, you know these people had to go to the hospital sooner or later. But the whole idea is that their death from um, cardiac problems occurred sooner because they weren't getting the right medication, i.e., a beta blocker. And these were shown to be effective in 1982, by the way. So errors of omission, kind of, it, it's hard to get a handle on them unless you really look kind of in a global way. Now, on the fourth bullet here, I'm going to talk about uh, some things going on right now that maybe hospitals could do a lot better with. The first one has to do with uh, tobacco cessation care, uh, an article written by three experts and published in JAMA just um, less than a month ago address this situation. So we got 34 million smokers in this country, two-thirds of which want to quit. But what do hospitals do when a smoker comes through their walls? 
there is a measure that they could choose to use and report, but they do not. 2% of hospitals report this measure. Of those that report it, only 40% of the time did they offer smoking cessation to those patients. Of the 20, U.S. News and World Report best hospitals, none deal with smoking cessation as a measure of the quality of their care. So now I want to quote from this article uh, to roll it all up. The authors ask, why is the lack of treatment for tobacco dependence, a disease responsible for half a million deaths in the United States each year, still allowed in modern healthcare organizations? Good question. Now, I'm not going to talk in detail about high blood pressure, just to say it kind of parallels the tobacco issue. We've got a lot of Americans running around with high blood pressure, uh, and they're not, uh, attention's not being given to this. And we all know that if you have high blood pressure and don't do anything about it, your life is going to be shorter. Another thing that often I had not heard of until I came across this article from 2016 is the release of patients from the hospital when they're not stable. Now, this research team ask, okay, how many patients are actually being released in unstable conditions? And stability is, uh, instability is defined as, let's say, a heart rate over 100 beats a minute, uh, temperature above 100, uh, respir respiratory uh, rate above 24, and so on. There's five measures they use. What they found is that about 19% of patients released from the hospital have at least one instability. And if they have three or more instabilities, the chances that they will die in the next 30 days after release are four times what it would be for patients that were released with all these instabilities controlled. And now I want to quote from their article. The simple vital sign criteria could be used to assess safety for discharge and to reduce 30-day mortality and re readmissions. So there's, there's still opportunities out there, that's my point, to do better. Okay, now I want to talk a little bit about formed consent and shared decision-making. Shared decision-making is when there's a face-to-face -face dialogue with the clinician and the patient about what is needed in the patient's care. The physician brings technical information the patient brings their questions and their preferences to the table, and the dialogue goes forward. There are two kinds of informed consent in general. One is physician-centered, and the other is patient-centered. And the states are about equally divided on which approach is supposed to be taken. I would postulate that if informed consent is done well in the platform of shared decision-making, it has the potential to greatly reduce PAEs and the overall cost of medical care because patients are going to choose less invasive procedures and therefore less expensive procedures. Well, how well is informed consent done these days? There's not any information out there that I'm aware of other than a study published just a few months ago by Erica Spatz and her colleagues at Yale uh, University School of Medicine. Her, she and her colleagues took 25 hospitals and looked at about 100 records from each of those hospitals on informed consent. The, they found on their 20-point quality scoring system for informed consent that the average score was 4.5. Eight of the hospitals scored less than two, two or less, I'm sorry, points on the 20-point scale. A message there is informed consent sure is not being well documented and I suppose not well uh, done either in these hospitals. I believe informed consent should be centered on the reasonable patient, which goes back to the one form of informed consent, which is patient-centered. In my state of Texas, that's how informed consent is predicated, on what a reasonable patient would want to know. Uh, my colleagues and I published an, a study in 2019 in BMJ Open in which we asked people around the country through a survey monkey platform what they felt was reasonable in their care when they were in fa facing an invasive procedure in the hospital. And uniformly, with few exceptions, patients wanted to know everything about their options and their risks going forward. They wanted to know about potentially dangerous drugs. 
They wanted to know who was going to do their invasive procedure. Excuse me. And they wanted to know what the consequences were uh, if the nominal um, course was followed after the procedure was done. I think the National Patient Safety Authority should consider looking at this as a possible target. Uh, there's already a platform out there, thanks to Dr. Spatz, on how to measure this in hospitals. So what's the promise of the National Patient Safety Authority? It, I think it's independence from other sources of measurement of errors is important, particularly independence from the Joint Commission, and it should be driven by patients' insights. They must have investigative powers built on root cause analysis that includes everybody involved from the beginning, include the patient or uh, the patient's family, uh, survivors, and so on. It's got to be controlled by people with no direct connections to the medical industry, I think. It's got to be patient-driven, and there must be sufficient public awareness of its decisions to do what Dr. Feinstein said, which for the Transportation Safety Board, drive changes, drive seat belts, drive airbags, those kind of things. Uh, autonomous technology, if you will, that will further uh, the cause. And finally, I just want to say, so how is it made, this thing going to be made responsive to people? Now, I'm naive. I don't have any practical knowledge of what goes on in hospitals. So I can propose things that may be crazy, but I'm going to do it anyway. So the leaders of this authority would be elected from around regions of the country and be directly accountable to the people in their region. There should be paid technical experts to support them. There must be no political influence on these people. Nobody knows who, what party anybody's associated with. And there's none of these tacky ads that we all see this time of year attacking. It's direct election. Funding limitations could be handled by direct portion of the national budget going to this authority. No congressional manipulation. What I know is in a lot of states, Medical boards are manipulated by reducing funding, so they can't really investigate all the cases that are brought to them. And you can figure out who's keeping the funding low by influencing the legislature. At least that happens in Texas. Got to educate the public. They've got to know about this thing and know how to use it if they need to. Um, there should be national standards for some things. In my opinion, there should be national standards for informed consent, not state by state uh, standards. And finally, uh, you got to measure how things are going. Are you doing better with the PAs? Are you doing better with cost reductions and so on? Anyway, thank you for listening, and that's what I've got to say today, and I look forward to any questions you may have. Thank you for that enlightening presentation, John. I'm sure advocates are feeling inspired to take action now. Um, so next we'll hear from Regina Hoffman. Regina, can you hear us? Yes. Can you hear me now? Okay, great. Yes, perfect. Wonderful. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you so much for the introduction. Um, thank you, John. Thank you, Karen. I think you really set the stage um, for what could be. Um, I think there's, you, you know, we have this, the vision is there of, you know, what a national patient safety authority can do. We have um, the reason to do it. You know, we have the why. I think, uh, John, as, as a very strong patient advocate, along with so many other people that we know out there, we know the why. And it's for, you know, it's for our families, it's for our neighbors, it's for, you know, the, the patient down the hall. It's to make patient care better because we know after 20 plus years that we still have a problem. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit from a different perspective. Um, and it's not only what states can do, but it's more so what can all of these other organizations out there, like the one that, that I'm involved in and lead, how do we work together? Because I think there, when you hear something like, let's put together, let's have a national patient safety authority, it can cause some people to kind of step back and say, well, what does that mean for me? And is this a good thing? Is it a bad thing? How is it going to affect what we're doing locally or at a state level? Um, because as, as was noted, there are 
you know, a hundred or probably more than a hundred organizations out there um, working independently on patient safety. We have patient, you know, our actual formal patient safety organizations that are registered through AHRQ out there. We have other nonprofit um, research institutions out there, and we have state agencies like the Patient Safety Authority in Pennsylvania. You have Betsy Lehman in Massachusetts, the Maryland Center, and so forth. So what does that mean for the rest of us, and how, how do we approach this? How can we work together? So I wanted to take just a few minutes to give um, the audience some background on how patient safety is structured in Pennsylvania. And then what I really want to talk about is what are our what do we see as our strengths and what do we see as our weaknesses? And how can we, how do our strengths help influence the future success of the National Patient Safety Authority? And how do some of our weaknesses also influence the success of the National Patient Safety Authority? And again, how do we connect and how do we collaborate together to move forward? So uh, for those who aren't as familiar um, with the Patient Safety Authority as, as, as some of you are, the Pennsylvania Patient Safety Authority was created um, from a piece of legislation back in 2002, which most people know as the MCARE Act. Um, that stands for the Medical Care Availability and Reduction of Error Act. So this followed um, fairly quickly after you know, the 1999 IOM report to Air is Human. And this act came into place for really two reasons. It was to address the malpractice crisis that was going on in Pennsylvania um, at the time as well as to really take a look at how do we reduce medical errors and other patient safety events across the Commonwealth. And that's how we were formed, the Patient Safety Authority. So there's a couple key things from a structure standpoint that I think are important and kind of align a little bit with what we're talking about as we envision you know, a national patient safety authority. So we're, we are an independent state agency, um, meaning we are not um, we're not under the governor's, our governor's jurisdiction. We are governed by an 11-member board. So that, now that board is appointed by the governor and general assembly, but it does, you know, after that appointment takes place um, for our board members, it, we really are um, an independent state agency. So we, are, we have the ability to um, make our own policies. We have our own funding, so we're not part of um, the tax revenue um, in Pennsylvania. We have a dedicated funding stream um, that we collect through facility assessments. So what that does for us, it really, it doesn't eliminate political influence, but it really insulates us from direct political influence. We're not necessarily worried every time the state budget comes around whether our funds are going to be cut or if they're going to go away or if we're going to get the increase that we need. Um, when our uh, when this legislation was put into place, that was thought through ahead of time. So we have a dedicated funding stream that we control within limits um, each year. So that, that has been one of the keys to our success. The other piece that is so important is that we are non-punitive and non-regulatory. So we are not part of the regulations in Pennsylvania. We have our um, state Department of Health that is responsible for regulatory activity, not the Patient Safety Authority. So we are the agency that collects the information that comes in, and I'll talk a little bit about that, you know, what we collect and what we do with it. And we are the organization that goes out and, and helps facilities to make improvements in patient safety. Our State Department of Health is there to ensure that facilities are in compliance with the regulations. And I, I, I want to underscore the importance of this because if we were one and the same with the regulators, I do not believe we would have the successes and the relationships that we have with facilities and providers to be able to continue to move patient safety forward. And I'll talk a little bit about those relationships again in a minute. So what what do we do in Pennsylvania? So this is our patient safety learning model. And if you look on the left, you know, these are our inputs. We have, you know, we get information from patient safety professionals and we get information from patients and, and families as well. But the biggest piece, our biggest data source um, is this patient safety event data. Um, we have the largest database in the country, sing single database of patient safety event information. We have, there's about 4 million reports in that database 
right now, we get about 300,000 reports each year. Um, those reports include everything from those events that almost harmed a patient to those near misses, you know, something could have happened. I'm a, I'm, I'm a nurse by background, so it means I went in and, you know, during my shift, I pulled the wrong medication to give to my patient, but I, um, through my checks and balances, I found that, you know, wrong medication before it actually reached the patient. So I put it back, you know, got the correct one. So when that happens, facilities are required to report that near miss. So from those events that didn't even reach the patient all the way to the events that cause harm and death to patients, that's the breadth of the type of event that we collect. Another key piece to that is we do not just collect events where a medical error was involved. We collect um, events where there was an unanticipated harm. So sometimes that unanticipated harm is preventable and sometimes it isn't. We collect all of that. So all of that information is coming into our database. What we do with that is we have a, a data science and research team that works to convert that data into actionable knowledge and then get that information back out to facilities in a variety of ways. Um, we do that through our journal. So we regularly publish, you know, the findings from the, that we're seeing in the reports. We have an annual report that also, you know, we share those findings with facilities. Center of Excellence for Improving Diagnosis. We know that those are some of the hardest um, types of events to capture, and one of uh, one of the most difficult challenges that we that we have in healthcare is how do we work on improving diagnosis. We have our field staff, which I'll share a little bit more uh, uh, about them in just a minute, that provide um, a lot of provider education, and we also do a lot of public um, education and campaigns to try to engage patients and families in patient safety. We have the ability to go out and provide consultations um, to the healthcare facilities in Pennsylvania. We run collaboratives, we issue safety alerts, toolkits, so we have a wide variety of things that we can do based upon the information that we get. One of the most unique aspects of our work is, you know, a lot of this goes on behind the scenes, but then every healthcare facility in Pennsylvania has a person um, assigned to them. So these are our patient safety liaisons and also our infection preventionists. So if I'm a healthcare facility in Pennsylvania and I have a patient safety issue, I had something that happened, um, I want to talk that through with someone. I want to come have someone come in and provide education or do a consultation, look at our processes, things like that. There is a person that every healthcare facility in our Commonwealth can, can contact and has regular communication with. Um, so if you look, you know, the, the bottom left-hand corner of our map is, is Bob Yanish. So his facilities, you know, they, he, he's in there and he all, I don't want to say all the time, but very, very frequently. So over the years, um, our liaisons have had the opportunity to build relationships with the healthcare facilities. So that way when something bad does happen, facilities feel comfortable reaching out and asking for the assistance or asking, you know, what kind of resources and tools do we have to help them? And that's the difference between a patient safety authority that is non-punitive and non-regulatory and independent of the regulators versus one that is kind of, you know, every, it's all in one. If that's what you have, um, you're not going to have... Whether we like it or not, we're not going to have as open communication um, with that agency at, compared to if they're independent and, again, they're non-punitive and non-regulatory. Um, so those are, that is one of our biggest strengths, is that we've developed over time a relationship with those entities to be able to work together. We, they know that we are partners in this. You know, we are, we are not, we're, we're not the enemy. We're not there um, to, um, to ding somebody, but that's, that's not our intent. That's not the intent of the regulators either, but I think when you're on the provider side, that's sometimes how you tend to perceive it. Um, so that's been key, and when you look at, you know, um, what Dr. Feinstein has kind of envisioned as this entity on a national level being separate and distinct from the regulatory end of things, that I think that's really important. So when we talk about those, you know, those are our strengths, but what are some of our weaknesses? Um, and we have them. You know, we have a, Pennsylvania has a, a very robust patient safety program. 
Um, there are a lot of people across the country that will call and ask us, you know, ask us questions. How are you doing this? Or, um, you know, they look to the information that we're putting out. But we, we don't have this solved either. And it's frustrating um, for us as well because we know that there are events still happening on a daily basis that need to be addressed. So where we fall short is we, we get all this information. Um, and the information that we get is basically it's what happened. You know, here was the event that happened. But we don't have the ability in our legislation to go out and actually investigate what happened from a patient safety standpoint, not from a regulatory standpoint, but doing that root cause analysis, finding out what caused the problem, not just here's what happened, but what were here were some of the root causes, and then being able to have the resources to go out and really develop some of those innovative solutions um, that Dr. Feinstein was talking about. So our strengths are our infrastructure, our relationships, being able to take information to facilities, help them to implement things, uh, and assist them along the way. The piece that we're missing is that information um, that Karen talked about and also that John talked about is, you know, how do we get to what's actually, what's going on here? We don't have the ability to do that. So that's when, when we sit back and we look at, you know, how can our organization and a national organization, how can we complement each other? That's how. You know, we have the, we have the event and we have the tools to, to help people, but we don't have the ability, to, again, to get to those root causes and get to real life innovative solutions to make a difference um, as we go forward. Um, so I would encourage the folks that are listening that are from other types of patient safety organizations um, to really look, again, what are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? What do you bring to the table? Um, so that we can work better together. You know, we don't want to be in a position that we are um, creating redundant work. When, you know, we don't want to be doing the same things. We want to do, be doing work that's complementary and can really, you know, move the needle. Um, you know, we, we need that swerve. I think um, that it's a, that's the direction that we need to go in because we've been doing this long enough. We've seen, you know, minimal improvements um, in certain areas but we need to do something dramatic. Um, so with that, I will turn it back to you. And I think at this point, we're going to be open for questions. Yes, thank you so much <clears throat> for that, Regina. And you are right, we will be moving on to question and answer. And we are really excited to hear from everyone that's joined this webinar today. So there's two ways you can ask questions. If you're dialing in using your phone, you can press star six to unmute yourself or you can just type in a question in the chat, as I see someone has already done. Um, and as a reminder, please do not put us on hold. If you unmute yourself and put us on hold, then we can hear your hold music and it'll play over all of our discussion. Um, so to kick things off, I want, and I'll get to Judith's question next. I want to ask one question. Um, both Karen and Regina mentioned the plethora of agencies with sometimes redundant responsibilities. How likely is it that these agencies will feed power over to some of these areas to a centralized authority? And what might happen to patient safety entities out there that don't rise to the standards of an organization like the Pennsylvania Patient Safety Authority to have a formal relationship with the National Patient Safety Authority? Well, I'd be happy to, to start here. Um, I don't think every organization that touches on patient safety should necessarily continue, particularly when there's a public investment. I'm not sure we need more than one PSO per state. We have 90 now, maybe more as we sit here. But, you know, I think that that the strong agencies who want to work together with a centralized authority want to look at standardized data collection processes that I think that they're really important. They need to continue. And there are other agencies as well um, that I think we would all hold in high regard. But there are some agencies that, frankly, I think have outlived their usefulness as they're presently configured, and I think Somebody, some commission or congressional panel should take a look. Um, I don't think that everything continues indefinitely. I think that they have to be held to a certain 
accountability, and I think it's time. Yeah, thanks for that answer, Karen. Um, I can turn it over now to some of the questions in the chat. So Judith Garber asks, how has the Pennsylvania or National Patient Safety Authorities helped reduce patient safety events caused by overuse? This is Regina, and I will, I will answer that question, and I will answer it in full transparency. We have not. In Pennsylvania, that overuse, um, one, we're dependent upon people actually reporting that through our system. Um, so that's, that is definitely one of those things that's harder um, to wrap your arms around. It's not something that you could say, okay, well, this medication error happened or this patient fell. When you start to look at things, um, you know, overuse of procedures, meds, et cetera, um, in full transparency, we do not have good data on that. Um, so probably not the answer that people want to hear, but that's, um, that's where we are with it. Also, Regina, we have to acknowledge that our payment system in this country, I, I don't think there's anyone I, who would argue, it actually encourages overuse uh, until we can move away from fee-for-service. But I want to say something. A lot of people say to us, okay, that is part of the problem. Overuse is a serious problem. Thank you, Judith Garber. Um, and it does lead to more errors, obviously, and harm. The problem is, and the challenge we throw out to everyone, is when we go to countries where there is not an economic reward for error or overtreatment, why do they also have a large number of medical errors? So changing the payment system would, in many ways, I think, reduce overuse, but I don't think it's the sole answer uh, to reducing medical errors. Thank you for those honest answers. <laughs> um, next, I'll ask a question from Peggy Zuckerman. How does the patient who is misdiagnosed report that as a harm, and what is effective at the local level versus state or reporting organization? So I will. I can take that one. And again, I am only speaking for what happens in Pennsylvania, and I am not intimately familiar with the reporting requirements of other states across, you know, across the country. In Pennsylvania, patients who have been misdiagnosed, their mechanism for reporting that or um, filing a complaint, or however you want to term that, is through the, um, the Department of Health. So our reporting system is set up very specific to providers and not to the general public. Um, so the mechanism in Pennsylvania is the person would need to basically you know, to file a complaint with the Department of Health, or, um, they can with the medical board as well, and then our Department of Health would be responsible for investigating that patient's concern. But would, there is not, um, if, if the question is bigger than that, looking at like, is there a database or something, there is, currently there is not. And we know, Peggy, that um, people turn to trial lawyers because they really don't often have an outlet. More often, I mean, what we hear from, you know, our tri we have trial lawyers that sit on our board of directors, and one of the things that we hear frequently is, you know, they have oftentimes patients and families that are coming into their office because um, no one else would talk to them. Um, so they're going looking for answers. They're not necessarily going there with the intent of a lawsuit. They're, 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 their first reason for being there is that they're looking for answers and no one else has been able to provide it to them. Yeah, thank you for those answers. I think your answers really highlight the fact that we need a swerve, as Dr. Feinstein called it, and we can't just carry on doing business as usual. Um, so there's another question in the chat here from Carol. Uh, she asks, the work of the Pennsylvania Safety Authority is impressive. Is there any impact on the overall state's metrics regarding patient safety? What has been the impact? That is a great question, Carol. And I think it's one that we all, um, all of us, whether we're at a state level, national or local, um, something that we struggle with are the metrics. 
one of the things that that we look at um, when you like as a general metric we've looked over time you know what has really happened with the event reporting itself um, because we know when reporting first started back in 2004 you know we didn't get a lot of reports right away and we've put programs and education in place over the years to emphasize the importance of reporting. What does it mean? What do people have to report? So one of our metrics is over time, are we actually seeing the report go up or go down? Um, because when, you, when you're providing education and you're supporting a culture of safety where people are encouraged to report and they're encouraged to be tr transparent, you would expect the reporting numbers overall to go up. So we have seen year over year our reporting has increased a lot and that's all reporting so those are you know those near misses um, you know things that have not reached the patient or didn't harm the patient all the way up to you know those events that you know cause you know they were catastrophic they caused permanent harm they caused death to a patient so that overall our reporting has gone up what we've also seen is in the reverse are high harm events those are those ones again where people these are life-threatening, you know, something happened to the patient and they needed to be transferred to the intensive care unit um, because they needed to be ventilated. Um, they had permanent harm from it, you know, um, from the event that happened where they died. We've seen those events over time come down. So that's, 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 that's one, that's, you know, one measure um, that, we, that we look at. But it is, our, it is really, really difficult. And I sound like I'm making excuses I'm not, but it's hard when you're looking at reporting that's coming from facilities. So even though reporting is mandatory, you're still relying on people to send that information in. And the more you educate people and the more you support that culture, you expect the reports to go up, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the events are going up. It's hard to know what that's in the facilities, what's actually happening with the events. And that's why I think looking at some of the, the automated ways of data mining, uh, particularly if we look to the future directly from medical records and things like that, um, will give us a much better picture on not just what's getting reported, but what's actually going on at the facility level. Thank you for that answer. Um, we only have a few minutes left, so I'll get in Patricia's question here. She asked, what is the overlap of a patient safety authority's work and disciplining doctors through medical boards? Some patient safety errors and omissions are caused by poor systems, but others are based on incompetent performance by providers. Well, I do have to say to Patricia, right on, yes. And with all the license, licensure, certification, accreditation agencies, with all that we have, they should be protecting us, not only the the poorly performing doctors um, and the ones who aren't competent, but also the doctors who've gone rogue. I have to tell you, with that whole army of bureaucracy we have, it is very hard to get action. Trust me. And you only have to look at the front pages of a lot of our papers uh, to see that these doctors repeat their bad performance. They go from one system to another. Um, and it's terrible. There is really very little safety net in this area. Yeah, thank you for that answer. Um, and I guess I just want to leave off with this one question, and really we could have a full webinar just devoted to this one question that I'm interested to hear from speakers. What recommendations do you have for someone who would like to build support for an establishment of an entity like the NPSA, and how do we build a movement around this? Oh, I think about that every day. Thank you so much for asking. Um, I am very surprised that there isn't more outrage in this country, not only for how we've managed COVID um, and protecting workers and patients, uh, but there, there have been so many unnecessary deaths and then annually for medical error. If anyone has a magic formula for awakening the public and getting a public outcry, I would love to know it. Otherwise, I think we go through Congress. Um, you get a 
champion at Congress and hopefully perhaps in the White House. That's how the um, uh, Consumer Financial Protection Board, some of you may have remembered under Elizabeth Warren, that's how it got established. Obama just loved the idea and pushed it forward. So you can go a congressional route, you can go the White House route, but I, sadly, John, I'm not waiting for a, um, a public revolt or patient revolt. It, it hasn't happened yet with all this sad tragedy every year of these unnecessary deaths from preventable error. I think you, we just have to be smart and understand. And the Consumer Financial Protection Board is a great example. These things do get created. They do happen. But I think you have to go to where the power is to create them and find a champion. Thank you for that. Um, and before could we I, could sign I, off, I, oh, sure, sure, John, go ahead. Yeah, John, yeah, I, I might add just a little bit to what Karen said because I think legislators like models that work. And so you've got the model that works in Pennsylvania. So you kind of say, hey, this is working in Pennsylvania. Why not go national with it? And I think that I think you could get support in Congress to do that, depending on how things change in November. But um, with the model, you've got more power. Yes, absolutely. It's evidence-based um, strategies. Okay. Well, um, before we sign off, we have two new resources on our website. One is an easy explainer describing our current medical harm problem and what a national patient safety authority could look like. The other is a glossary on medical harm terms. Um, we have lots of great resources on our website for you to learn more. And we'll also be sharing some resources from our excellent speakers after the event. Um, many thanks to our wonderful speakers for sharing their knowledge and answering our questions. Um, and thanks to the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation for supporting our work as well. So thank you all for attending. We hope this really gets the movement going. <laughs> so have a great day. Thank you, everyone.